Let me ask you to take your Bibles and look with me in the letter of James, chapter 5. We're actually going to be moving into the final section in the book of James this morning uh, in chapter 5. But as I studied this chapter this week, I realized it's going to take me three Sundays to get through it. So uh, I didn't figure you want to sit here for an hour and a half while I preach through that. So we're going to break it. And actually, there are three parts of it. But um, this morning, we're going to take the first part of the last section of the letter of James. Would you stand in honor of God's word as we begin reading in verse 7 of chapter 5? James says, therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it, until it gets the early and late rains. You too, be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. As an example, brethren, of suffering and patience, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We count those blessed who endured. You have heard of the endurance of Job and have seen the outcome of the Lord's dealings, that the Lord is full of compassion and is merciful. God bless the reading of his word. Thank you. Please be seated. So James writes this last section, his signature on his letter to these churches with a word of encouragement and exhortation to these Believers who have been scattered out of Jerusalem, that have been removed from their homes, that have been dislocated from their network of friends, and even some from families, who have lost their jobs, maybe lost their land, and they are under duress. They are under pressure. And James writes in these final words in his letter to encourage them. And one of the things that he says in this encouragement is to wait on the Lord. He says to wait on the Lord. Now, that's not a new phrase. We see that exhortation, we see that command all throughout the Bible to wait on the Lord. David talks about waiting on the Lord. The prophet Isaiah talks about waiting on the Lord. And he said, those that wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. And now James, here in the New Testament, as he writes to these believers that have been dispersed out of Jerusalem, he tells them, wait on the Lord. Now, you know, as as I have been your pastor and watched you over the years, I have noticed that some of you have an unbelievably strong ability to wait on the Lord. Not much rattles you. Not much gets you upset. You're able to walk through rough waters right on cue. That is not one of my spiritual gifts. <laughs> I, um, I have battled the inability to have patience all of my life. And it seems like God knows that very well. And he puts me in those places where he can test that ability. I remember when Diane and I had gone to the very first full-time job that I had in ministry. It was, I was a youth minister down at Nassau Bay, and it was in the wintertime. It was, it was right before Christmas. We were, we were getting ready to go back to see our families in Groves and Beaumont, Port Arthur, uh, for, for Christmas time. And in my, it was the, the day we were going to leave to go back, and and in my quiet time that morning, I prayed, God, I want to have patience because I know I'm not a patient person. And I said, God, please teach me patience. 
Now, let me just warn you, if you pray that prayer, you get ready. You buckle up your seatbelt and you get ready because God will teach you patience. And I won't go into all the details, but uh, that afternoon we were supposed to leave Nassau Bay, which is just down south, just south of Baytown a little bit. And uh, we were going to drive back home, which should have been a two-hour drive. It ended up taking us five and a half hours uh, to get back home. And it was raining, it was cold, and my car just decided to get sick for some reason. And uh, God, put us, God put us through the test. He does that frequently. You know, I'm the guy that goes to the grocery store. When I get ready to check out, I see only one person in this line. There's four people in this line. So I say, I'm going to go to, you know, this, this line over here. Uh, less weight, just one person. They'll get on through. And then they pull out 49 coupons. <laughs> and, you know, they begin to go. And then they, they, they have a card that doesn't work. And then they decide they want to send something back. It was the wrong brand. I mean, you know, and I'm sitting here just ready to. <laughs> God says, wait on me. It's not just an exhortation, as we're going to see. It's not just an exhortation to be patient. It's not just to build in us the virtue, virtue of patience, although that is part of it. But he tells these believers, I want to encourage you. I know it's hard. I know you're distraught. I know you're under pressure. I know there is a, a dark period in your life that you're walking through right now. But wait on the Lord. As I look out across this congregation during this last week, I taught to some of our families that are going through dark times, difficult times, pressured times. I taught to a daughter whose mother passed away this week. Just a year ago, she lost her husband in an unexpected death. I talked to a husband whose wife is battling cancer in the hospital. And he said, Pastor, I can't imagine life without her. Please pray. I talked to a mother whose son, in his 20s, his heart was attacked by a virus. And as he prepared for his wedding day, and he and his, his fiance prepared to get married. He found himself in the hospital with his heart only working 20% of its capabilities. Tough times. Pressured times. Some of you, you've been there or you're going through it. And we need to learn what it really means to wait on the Lord. Now, let me give you a little context here in this last part. So, for those of you that may not have been here before, James is writing, and James, this is not the Apostle James, he has already been martyred, but this is the half-brother of Jesus, who is writing to these believers who have been driven out of, of Jerusalem, probably due to Paul's, or Saul of Tarsus, persecution and the execution of one of the members of the church, Stephen. And great trials and persecution arose, so they were driven out of Jerusalem. They're in, uh, James says, the Judean region and the Samaritan region. They're hiding from the attack of the Pharisees and the Sadducees and especially Saul of Tarsus. And James is writing to encourage them and instruct them. And in this last section, there are, there are really three parts, as I mentioned earlier. We're going to take each one separately. But in this first part, he talks about patience or waiting on the Lord in verses 7 through 11. In verses 12 through 18, he talks about authentic faith. We're going to deal with that next Sunday. And then last, he finishes up by encouraging them in the ministry of restoration. So we're going to look at all three of those. But he first addresses them to wait on the Lord. And he tells them, wait on the Lord. And the reason for it is because his promise and his presence are sure. 
He begins by talking about the second coming of Christ. He said, therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. Now, that word there, the coming of the Lord, is really only one word. It's the word parousia. You've heard that word before. It means the gathering together of the saints. They had an eye out for Jesus Christ. There have been some theologians that said, ah, the early church did not believe that Christ was coming. Oh, really? Well, James just tells them right here that the Lord is coming back. In fact, he tells them just a little bit later, he is right at the door. The Apostle Paul, in talking about the coming of Jesus, begins to refer to himself in the resurrection. He said, we who are alive and remain when he comes will be caught up together with them in the, in the clouds. Paul included himself in that group of people that were still alive when Christ came. The church was looking for Jesus. And James uses that as an encouragement to these believers. He said, be patient until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient, strengthening your hearts for the coming of the Lord is near. James says God makes to us as his children, as his people, precious promises. One of those promises is that he is coming back. We don't hear that a whole lot anymore. We've kind of moved on to more sophisticated things like God wants you to be all that you can be. But one of the great promises of the Word of God is that Jesus Christ that came to this earth 2,000 years ago and lived a sinless life, died on a vicarious cross, and rose from the grave is coming back into human history. This time he's not coming back as a baby in Bethlehem. This time he's coming back as a reigning, ruling, resurrected Lord. He's coming back to claim his bride, his church. He's coming back to take command of all that he left behind here. So James says, the Lord is coming back. And he gives an everyday example. Every believer here could, could identify with this example, meaning if you can. He said, a farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until he gets the former or the early and the latter rains. There are two seasons of rain, monsoon seasons, if you will, in Israel. One is in late spring, about April, May. The other is in early fall, around September. And James says when the farmer plants, he plants in anticipation, he plants in expectation, but he plants being patient. He waits. He knows the crop is not going to come in tomorrow, so he waits. And that word wait is an interesting word. It doesn't just mean sit around and twiddle your thumbs. It actually includes two aspects. It's talking about time, you know, days, weeks, months. It's talking about time, but it's also talking about purpose. It's talking about activity. We look at Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, and he's, that's chapters 24 and 25. He's talking about the second coming, his second coming. And he uses a couple of parables there. One of those parables you're familiar with, the 10 virgins, who five who were wise, and they had brought extra oil for their lamps because they didn't know when the bridegroom would come. Five were foolish, Jesus said, and they didn't bring any extra oil. And so when the bridegroom delayed, their lamps ran out of oil, and they didn't have any more oil. They tried to get some from the other five, and they said, no, we can't loan you any hours, or, or we won't have enough. We don't know when the bridegroom's coming. They said, go into town and buy some more. So the five left. They went to buy some more. While they were gone, the bridegroom came. And he took his bride, he took the, the bride, bride's maids that were waiting 
And he went, they began to have the marriage feast and celebrate, and the other five came back, and the door was closed. Jesus said, that's going to be like how the Son of Man come. One of these days, I'm going to preach a message, and we're going to talk about a Jewish wedding and what Jesus meant there. And uh, it's a beautiful picture of his return. He told another story about talents, and he said a master went away. And he left his three servants in charge. And he gave five to one and three to another and one to the third servant. And he said, take care of my business until I return. And the five, the one that had five, the one that had three, they both, both invested their master's money and they doubled it. The one who only had one went, took and buried it. And the master came when they weren't expecting and he took account of his business. Two were faithful. But one said, I wasn't sure. I know what kind of guy you are. You're a hard guy. You, 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 every, you have the Midas touch. Everything you touch turns to gold. I don't think I have that. And so I just buried your talent. I buried what you gave to me to say, do business with this until I return. Now, Jesus was talking about the same thing James is talking about here, that waiting on the Lord has both a time aspect and a purpose aspect. It has a time aspect in that we don't know when Christ will return. They were looking for him 2,000 years ago, and they were expecting him 2,000 years ago. How much more should we be expecting Christ return today? but they're waiting. He said, we don't know when. Just as the farmer does not know the day that his crops are going to come in, but he waits. But it also includes this aspect of purpose. You know that farmer, after he plows his field and after he plants his seed, he doesn't pick up his fishing pole and say, I'm going fishing for three months till the crops come in. And then I'll return and I'll, I'll harvest crop. No, he continues to work. What does he do? He prepares his barns. He works on his equipment. He protects his field from wild animals, from others that would steal his crops. He's busy during those times. He has purpose during those times because he believes there's a harvest coming. He believes God is going to bless my planting efforts. I look at these missionaries right here, and they're in a planting stage right now. They're investing in other indigenous pastors, equipping them on how to share the gospel and to take Christ outside of the walls of their church in South Asia. In Logan, we've been planting. We're beginning to see fruit. We're beginning to see the crops come up out of the ground and some fruit on some of the heads of the crops. And some people have given their lives to Christ. But we wait, not idly. No, that, that was the fault of that third servant who said, you know, I just didn't know what to do. And I was afraid that I'd, I'd bungle it up. So I just, I, just, I just hit it in the ground. Kind of just stuck his head in the sand and said, I'm going to just hold on till the owner returns. And God says, no, no, no. No, you and I, as we wait for the Lord, are to be busy. We're to be living in faithful obedience to Christ, anticipating his return so that when he comes, he'll find us faithful. He'll find us active. He'll find us living for his glory. There's another promise here that James makes about God's presence and God's promises is that God gives us assurances of his presence right here, right now. And he also gives his promise that he will return. And he does this, and you might have missed it, but it's in a little phrase there that the farmer waits in expectation until the early and the latter rains. You know what those rains tell that farmer? 
crops are going to come in. If they don't have those rains, the seed will die in the ground. If they don't have the latter rains, the crops that have come up will wither and dry. You probably have some flowers like that at your house right now, don't you? Yeah. I look out at my beautiful brown yard, and I'm so happy, proud of it. So the farmer knows I've got to have the early rains to germinate the seed. I've got to have the latter rains to, to sustain the, the, the growth of the, of the fruit. And when he gets those early and latter rains, he knows I'm going to have a harvest. Can I tell you something? Every day, every day, God gives us assurances of his promise and his presence. He lets us know, I'm right here. I'm right here. He did that supremely 2,000 years ago. One, by raising his son victoriously out of the grave. That was the seal on the promise of eternal life that God offers you. If you're here today and you say, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure whether I have eternal life or not. I'm not sure if I have a relationship with God. Let me tell you what. God has already notarized and stamped that promise that you can have eternal life. You can know him. He wants you to. He did it by raising his son out of the grave. If Jesus hadn't come forth, we wouldn't have a gospel. If Jesus hadn't come forth, we would have no power for eternal life. There would be no promise of eternal life. We'd have no ability to experience resurrected life if Jesus hadn't come out of the grave. But because he rose, we can have eternal life. You can have eternal life. You can know God's presence in your life right now. And you say, well, what's that like? Well, that's the second promise that God sent, the guarantee was himself again, the Holy Spirit, who came on the day of Pentecost and invaded every heart of every believer. And let me tell you something. When you give your life to Jesus Christ, that very moment, God moves in. He takes up residence in the home of your heart. And he says, I'll never leave you. I'm not going to come in and then move out. I'm coming in to stay, and I'll give you eternal life. And then there, there are things that God does every day, little, just little things that I call God things. And I love to, you know, when I hear somebody say something, I say, man, that's a God thing. That's God's hand. Don't, don't, don't miss it. Don't miss it. We, we get so busy sometimes, we, we pass up and we overlook God's activity in our lives. But God assures us, God assures us. I'm here, and I keep my promises. So James was telling these people who were hurting, who were going through a dark period in their lives, who were disassociated from their homes and many times their families and their network of friends, wait on the Lord because he's here, and his promise is sure. Second thing that he promises them, or he exhorts them at least, he says, wait on the Lord and don't be bitter toward others. He says in verse 9, do not complain, brethren, against one another. The word literally means criticize or be, be critical or judgmental. So that you yourselves may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. Again, he's reminding them Christ is coming back. Don't let him catch you living with a critical, bitter spirit. One of the, I think one of the most dangerous things that a believer can fall into is a spirit of bitterness. You know, bitterness, as the old saying goes, is that poison that we drink thinking it's going to kill somebody else. But it doesn't. It kills you. Whoever drinks that cup of bitterness and develops a bitter heart and a critical and judgmental heart toward others is only killing themselves. They're ruining 
their own lives. They're, they're, they're walking through a sea of, of mire and muck and blood that God never wanted you to walk through. So James exhorts them, don't be bitter in your life. Now, it would be, it would be easy, I would think, for these folks to be bitter. Some hotshot Pharisee in Jerusalem, you know, uh, kicked them out of their own homes, led them away into exile, and they feared for their lives, they feared for their safety, they feared for their income. So we would think they might have reason to be bitter. But James says, don't be bitter. And don't be judgmental of your brothers and sisters in Christ, even when they have wronged you. Now, we know that was taking place because in the last chapter, we, James talked about those who were rich that were taking advantage and misusing and abusing the poor. I know people can be ugly. Believe me. I know that people can attack you. I know that people can be judgmental and criticize you. But don't be bitter. Don't let that set up a poison in your own heart. Don't become bitter and judgmental. It will not resolve conflict if you do that. And it may bring judgment upon yourself. James encourages them and he encourages us to reach out in grace and compassion. To love them back. That's what Jesus did. When the political rulers and the religious rulers attacked him, Jesus reached back out in grace and compassion. Now, he reached out in truth as well. He didn't mince words about what was right and what was wrong. But he loved them as well as he loved everyone else. And James warns us that God will deal with a critical and a judgmental spirit. So this is a word to those of you that may say, boy, pastor, I, I'm afraid I have, that, I have that critical spirit. Get rid of it. Confess it to God today. It is a poison in you that will destroy you before it destroys anybody else. So don't be bitter even when somebody else is wrong, you don't judge your brothers and sisters. But then he says in the last two verses, he said, don't be bitter when circumstances are bad. Boy, we always say, I'm ready. I'm, I'm going to stand for Jesus. But let the pressure get heavy. Let the temperature get hot. And it gets hard. It gets hard when circumstances are bad, when your wife is sick, when your kids are rebelling, when your job is in jeopardy, when financial pressure is closing in. It gets hard. And James encouraged them. He said, you want to you see an example, brothers, of suffering and patience? Take the prophets. Look at the prophets of the, he's talking about the prophets of the Old Testament. How they would go out and they would preach the word of God and sometimes it cost them their lives. Sometimes it cost them their freedom. You remember Jeremiah? I love Jeremiah. I can identify with Jeremiah. Jeremiah was totally transparent. He, di he didn't, you know, he didn't try to act spiritual and holy. He just said, God, you deceived me and I was deceived. Why did God deceive him? Because God told him, go out and tell them what's going to happen. Go out and tell the king of Judah that he's going to fall. And Jerusalem's going to be waylaid. And my people are going to be taken away in exile. And Jeremiah did that. And the king didn't like that message. He wanted to be the best you can be for God, you know, kind of message. And Jeremiah didn't give him that. And so what happened? Jeremiah was thrown in prison while the kings of Babylon were invading Jerusalem. Jeremiah was in jail. He was ultimately carried away in the Babylonian exile. 
And Jeremiah got into deep depression. He said, oh, I cursed the day I was ever born. Whoever told my mother congratulations ought to be whipped for having me. But he was willing to endure in the name of the Lord. So, James encourages us, look to people who have gone before you. Look to people who are around you that have endured tough times. They've endured the pressure and they've walked through it for the glory of God. Let me tell you something. If you're going through that rough time right now, and I know some of you are, walk through it with endurance, trusting in the presence and the power and the promise of God. And God will use that time in your life to be a testimony and a ministry to somebody else. He tells them to, to, to look at the prophets. And then, and then he calls up Job. And he said, you've heard about Job and the endurance that he had. What happened to Job? Well, it was a long process. We don't know how long. But he endured the loss of his children, the loss of his property, the loss of all of his wealth. He lost everything he had and ended up on a ha ash heap with boils. It's a pretty bad day, isn't it? And Job complained. It's interesting because Job complained. Job argued with God. You read the book of Job, you'll see. Man, Job struggled, but he did it in faith. He said, God, I, I just need to know what's going on here. And in the end, God showed him, Job, I want you to know, I wanted you to learn that I am God and you are not, but you can trust me. And when Job surrendered to that, God restored all that he had. And that's what James ends with, and I want to end here with you, is that God is full of of mercy and compassion. And though the day may be dark today, for a while, God will bring you through. Lean on him. Wait on him. Be faithful to him, even during the darkness. And he will show compassion. He will show mercy. He'll bring you out.